I'd like to introduce Orr and Shmuel. Here we go, and away we go. Okay, hi everyone. Today we will present Quick Shell. Sharing is caring about an RC attack chain on QuickShare. So, my name is Or Yair. I'm the security research team lead at SafeBridge. I have more than six years of experience in security research. My past research included some research on Linux environments, embedded, uh, embedded devices, Android devices, and more. And for more than three years now, my main focus lies in vulnerability research in the Windows operating system and third-party apps that run on it. Hi everyone, my name is Shmuel Cohen and I'm excited to be here today and present the finding of our recent research. A little bit about myself, I have six years of experience in the cybersecurity industry. Previously, I conducted APT malware research within the Checkpoint Research Group and currently I'm part of the SafeBridge original research team where I focus primarily on vulnerability research on various products. Okay, so let's see what we're going to talk about today. We'll start with what is QuickShare and why we chose it as our primary target for this research. We'll then move on to get, to get a brief overview about the protocol that QuickShare uses. We'll then see the first research approach that we took for this research, which is fuzzing. We'll see the research approach shift um, that we took that led us to other vulnerabilities, and we'll see the vulnerability discovery that, um, that we had, vulnerability discoveries that we had um, based on these two approaches. Then we'll see how we managed to assemble a very unconventional and creative RC attack chain from these vulnerabilities. And we'll conclude with takeaways and a link to the GitHub repository of all the tools that we created. So, what is QuickShare? QuickShare is Google's nearby file transfer solution for Android, just like Apple's AirDrop. QuickShare was formerly known as NearbyShare, and then last January at CES, Google and Samsung decided to combine their file sharing solutions into a single one and call it QuickShare. So we know what the talk is about, but why did we even choose to target QuickShare? Last July, Google has officially released a Windows version of QuickShare for Windows, allowing to share files between Windows computers to any other device with QuickShare. An interesting fact from Google's announcement about QuickShare at CES is that they are working with leading PC manufacturers, just like LG, to expand QuickShare to Windows PCs as a pre-installed app, making QuickShare for Windows a much more attractive target. Moreover, QuickShare performs file transfers using several communication methods. It supports WebRTC, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, NFC, Wi-Fi Direct, and even sending files over a Wi-Fi hotspot of one of the devices. As far as we knew, QuickShare was Google's first Windows app to use all these communication methods. In general, most of Google's services that are used on Windows are in the browser. This was a first of a kind for Google, and thus chances for mistakes were higher. Looking for past research, the only one that we could really find was a research called Nearby Threats, reversing, analyzing, and attacking Google's nearby connections on Android. The research analyzed Google's Nearby Connections API, that is the API that Nearby Share and later on QuickShare use in their implementations. And QuickShare and Nearby Share didn't even exist back then. It was just an API for third party applications. The Windows app did not exist um, also, of course. Another interesting fact was that we saw that most of the application's code can be found in open source repositories by Google. It was not all of it, but some of it at least. And in addition, we just could not find any CVEs related qu to QuickShare. Concluding all of these facts together led us to evaluate QuickShare as a valuable and likely to be breached target. Our final goal was to achieve something that was never achieved using QuickShare, 
and that was remote code execution. Starting our journey, we needed to understand QuickShare's protocol, of course. Therefore, the first thing we did was to find the most basic functions that QuickShare uses to send and receive packets. Once we find such functions, if they are generic and are used for all communication methods, then we'll be able to get a clear view of all packets that are, ba that are being sent and received by the app in their binary form. Then, just as we needed, we found the read and write functions as part of a base class that was called base endpoint channel. Deeper inside the read function, we were able to understand that the packets that packets that are being sent and received are packets of a type called offline frame. That is because each packet that was received was parsed into an offline frame object. But the offline frame object was not a normal object as its class was, ge was generated by protobuf. In here we can see the protobuf de definition of offline frame and using protobuf this proto file is being compiled into CPP files that define the offline frame and provide functions to serialize it to bytes and deserialize it from bytes. But don't be alarmed by the name offline frame too much because offline frame is the base type for almost all packet types that we are going to discuss in this talk and so from now on we will just mostly call them packets instead of offline frames. And so our first tool for this research was born pretty fast. We needed a tool that will provide us abilities to watch the communication. So we wrote a DLL that hooks the read and write functions and textually logs each packet that is being sent and received with all of its fields. This tool allowed us to understand the protocol much better and Shmuel will be the one to elaborate on what we learned. Thank you all. Cool. So now that we can sniff QuickShell packets, it's time to take a deep dive of the protocol used by QuickShell. So there's an API called Nearby Connections API, and it's used to discover, connect, and exchange data with nearby devices in real time, regardless of network connectivity. QuickShell uses the Nearby Connections API with its own implementation. Let's start with reviewing the Nearby Connections API. So it's based on protobuf, which is used to serialize structured data. It's mostly encrypted. The encryption is handled using Google's Yuki2 library. Each app is uniquely identified within the nearby connections API by a service ID that is provided by the app's developers. It has multiple connection strategies, such as peer-to-peer, -peer, star, and a cluster. We will focus on the peer-to-peer -peer strategy because it's the one used by QuickShell. In this strategy, there's initiator and the responder functioning much like a client and a server. In our protocol overview, we will examine packets that send during a file transfer from a phone to a PC. The first stage of communication is a connection request packet. Following that, the initiator starts with encryption handshake. The encryption handshake starts by sending a UKEY client init packet to the responder. Then the responder replies with a Yuki server initialization packet. And finally, the initiator responds with a Yuki client finish packet. At this point, the Yuki encryption handshake is successfully completed, ensuring that all subsequent packets will be encrypted. Next, the responder sends a connection response packet, indicating that it's accepted the connection, and the initiator responds with a similar packet back. At this point, QuickShell proprietary communication begins. This proprietary communication uses various types of packets provided by the nearby connections API. Let's review some of those packets. So these packets, as all mentioned, are called offline frames. Here you can see all types of packets that can be used within the protocol. So far, we've seen two types, the connection request and the connection response. In our talk, we will focus on two types, payload transfer and bandwidth hybrid negotiation. Now let's explore how QuickShare manages the connections at this stage. Just a quick reminder, this is where we stopped earlier, just when the property communication begins. The next sequence of packets were payload transfer, which both sides send to each other. 
Using our sniffer, let's examine those packets. As shown in the image, the payload transfer packet contains binary data, which was initially unclear to us. However, with the help of another portable file that we found in the Chromium open source project, we were able to decode this binary data and we discovered that the payload transfer packet contained another packet called paired key encryption. So both sides exchanged this key, uh, paired key encryption packet followed by a paired key resolved packet. We work to understand the purpose of these packets and with the help of our sniffer, we observe that they used among other things to enforce um, device visibility modes. These modes allow the user to control who can send data to them. For example, the user can choose that only their contact will be able to send data to them. After this stage is done, the initiator that wants to send the file sends an introduction packet. As a result, the responder is prompt with a file introduction dialog on the computer saying that the initiator would like to send the file. To receive the file, the responder simply, simply needs to press the accept button, which will cause QuickShell to send an accept packet to the initiator. After the responder accepts, the initiator sends the file using a payload transfer packet. And that's it. After this stage is completed, the file will be sent. Let's see a short demo of this overview. So on the right side, we have a phone, and on the left side, we have a PC which uh, QuickShare is installed. And we'll just show how a file transfer normally sent from a PC to a phone. So choosing the target device, the phone gets prompt with an accept or decline dialog. The phone uh, chooses to accept, and the file is on the phone. Sim it's, it's very simple, right? So now that we have basic understanding of how QuickShare file transfer works under the hood, we can proceed to fuzz the, this flow um, on QuickShare in, uh, for Windows. We chose the most straightforward infrastructure for fuzzing in Windows, which is WinAFL, of course. For instrumentation, we use Dynamo Rio, and since Protobuf is being used everywhere, we wanted a solution that supports Protobuf as well. Google developed a Leap Protobuf mutator that can be used with U uh, WinAFL. Combining these solutions together helps us a lot in the fuzzing process, and let's now discuss our approach. So our goal is to fuzz an entire session of file sending, rather than just individual packets. However, there might be a potential issue with this approach. Can you guess what? So as we already mentioned, when a file is sent, an accept or decline buttons are being prompt in the responder side. Since we want to fuzz all stages of communication, including when a file is being accepted, we needed our fuzzer, to, um, our, our fuzzing target, sorry, to accept every file that's being sent to it automatically without the need of the user to press the accept button. So we started to look for a ways to accept automatically every file that is being sent. Our first approach was to reverse engineer the relevant modules and patch it in such a way that every file will be accepted automatically. But fortunately for us, within the uh, Chromium open source project, we found out that Google already implemented a built-in feature called auto-accept. So we just needed to patch this if statement to make it work all the time. And that's exactly what we did. We located the relevant uh, uh, binary and we patched it. Now our fuzzing target automatically accepts every file every time. Next, we needed to implement a harness that could handle an entire session during each fuzzing iteration, rather than just sending a single packet. To achieve that, we created a simple binary format to encapsulate all packets for an entire session, which would be sent each fuzzing iteration. The structure we decided was straightforward. Four bytes for length, followed by a serialized offline frame of that length. At this stage, we were ready to start fuzzing QuickShare for Windows. However, as you can see on the screen, this process was quite slow. So we started to check again what makes us slow. And with the help of QuickShare logs, we found that after each file is being transferred, the stop advertising function is getting called. And as the name suggests, this function used to stop the advertising of the device, and later on, it's starting advertising back again meaning it's closing sockets, it's open new ones, and those things take time. 
On top of that, another function is called with the name remove endpoint, and it has 500 milliseconds flip at the end. Think about it. After each file it's been, uh, that is being sent, there's a half of a second sleep time. That's huge when you're talking about fuzzing speed. So again, we patched, we patched the relevant modules and prevented this behavior. Those patches help us a lot, as you can see. Made our fuzzing process much faster, about 10 times. Unfortunately, the speed improvement created a persistent issue for us, the combination of instrumentation, which significantly slows down the fuzzing target, and our patch to increase the file transfer speed led to an unheld race condition that was too complex to manage. As a result, we received numerous crashes report and we were, uh, that we were unable to reproduce. Therefore, we made a decision to abandon this approach and revert back to the original functionality of QuickShare. Despite its being slower performance, over time, the fuzzer did yield several positive, res uh, several positive, positive results. Let's discuss them. Overall, there were four reproducible crashes. We attempted to explore further the exploitation of those crashes, but they are unlikely to be exploited. But now we have the ability to crush QuickShare, and who knows, that ability might be handy in the future. Another very interesting uh, finding by the fuzzer was a reproducible timeout. You see, when QuickShare receives a file, it first checks the existence of a file with the same name by attempting to open it. If the file opens successfully, this, this indicates that the file is already exist. In response, QuickShell appends an index number suffix to the file name. It's very similar to what browsers do when you download the file. So QuickShell tries to add um, the suffix before the file extension, as you can see on the screen. That's why it splits the name into two parts, the name and the extension. But what happens if the name before the extension has a null terminator in it. The result is that anything added after a, the null terminator is irrelevant when the file name is passed to the open function. It reads the string up only to the null terminator. This causes QuickShare to get stuck in an endless loop, continuously incrementing indexes while mistakenly thinking it's searching for available index, when in fact it's trying to open the same files open over and over again. So, to sum things up, we managed to get um, the fuzzer working constantly, but each fuzzing iteration took too much time, making the process quite slow. Even when we identify some crashes, it wasn't uh, necessarily always exploitable. So, we thought it was time to review what we achieved and consider our next steps. We felt confident in enough with the quick share and the protocol um, to start searching for logical vulnerabilities and we certainly found some gold there. And one, obser one observation that we made is the code is extremely generic with a handler class for each packet type. Additionally, the code is filled with threads and async uh, methods all over the place. Those facts made us think it will be a good place to find vulnerability in it. So the first logical vulnerability that we'll introduce is a file acceptance bypass. As mentioned earlier, to send a file, the initiator first needs to send an introduction packet and wait for an accept packet from the responder. After that, the initiator will send a payload transfer packet containing our file. We thought to ourselves, wait, what happens if we skip the introduction and accept packets and send the payload transfer packet directly? We found out that the file will be sent anyway, resulting in a complete bypass of the acceptance of the, of the, of the file from the responder side. To make things even better, we discovered that this approach works for any discovery mode. So even if your device is con configured to accept files from your context, for example, we could still be able to send files to your device without requiring your acceptance and without any notification. It's on also important to note that this visibility mode doesn't grant a file transfer capability. Even if someone else can see your device for some reason in the quick share app, they won't be able to send files if your device is set to accept files only from your contacts. This is because the protocol includes a verification step at the beginning to ensure the sender is authorized to send files to the receiver. Let's see a demo of it. So we have our phone here, 
and we can see that I configured the phone to allow um, FISE acceptance only from your device. Now, let's see the quick shell folder. We can see that it's empty on the phone. And now let's see our attacker uh, machine. We used our tool, send files with bypass. And a few seconds after it, you could see that nothing happened on the phone, but our file is there. So we implement a file in the phone without any notification on any Android device that has QuickShare, and we can do it um, even on any, any Windows device that has QuickShare in it. Pretty awesome, right? Thank you. So let's continue with our next logical vulnerability forcing victim device to connect to a rogue Wi-Fi access point. In the context of data transfer, a medium refers to a channel through which information is transmitted. When sending a file, QuickShare checks whether there's a need to upgrade the medium and to achieve better transmission sp uh, speed. For example, upgrade from Bluetooth to Wi-Fi. As shown on the slide, there are various possible upgrades connections. When discussing um, bandwidth upgrade negotiation, uh, bandwidth upgrade negotiation, sorry, it's important to reference previous research that highlighted a specific attack scenario. In that study, researchers forced an Android device to connect to a rogue Wi-Fi uh, network to carry out a man-in-the-middle attack. This attack lasted maximum of 30 seconds and hence been mitigated by Google. Today, if your Android device receives an uh, bandwidth upgrade negotiation packet via QuickShare, other internet connections. Uh, will not be redirected to that Wi-Fi network. But what about Windows? We have noticed that uh, one of the upgrade methods is through Wi-Fi hotspot access point. Basically, during transfer, the initiator creates a temporary hotspot and sends to the responder the credentials to connect to this hotspot. By the way, this process can be initiated from the responder side as well. When the transfer is completed, this hotspot is getting closed. But we've noticed that during this time, the internet connection of the responder device is still working, even though it's connected to our hotspot. We started to sniff the network packets from the initiator device, and we found out that all the traffic from the responder side is going through our device, meaning that we can get a man in the middle for the time of the transfer and sniff the entire responder traffic. So I can connect every phone that has a quick shell to my hotspot and create a man in the middle attack. Now, I will continue and explain what we can be done next. Cool. OK, yeah, so uh, that was pretty awesome, forcing any Windows device with quick shell to connect to our rogue Wi-Fi AP. Um, but let's see what we managed to uh, find so far. So, so far we found eight vulnerabilities in total. The most critical vulnerability, in our opinion, was the one that allowed us to send a file without approval. But we were looking really for the holy grail, as I mentioned at the beginning, which was an RCE vulnerability that we still did not have. Thus, just like turning standard stones into deadly drones, that sounds pretty much impossible, we decided that we are going to chain these vulnerabilities into an RCE. So, so far we had four primary abilities using these eight vulnerabilities. We could create files in the victim's downloads folder without any requirement for acceptance or authorization. We could force the target device the target Windows device into connecting to a different Wi-Fi network and um, connect to the internet through it, but only for about 30 seconds. Um, we could also crash QuickShare in multiple ways that uh, we found using the fuzzer. And finally, um, we could also reproduce that reproducible timeout that we saw in that uh, the fuzzer found, which um, can force QuickShare into an endless loop continuously opening a file that we choose from the victim's download folder. Talking about the, men, the Wi-Fi man in the middle vulnerability, as, um, uh, as I mentioned, it allows us to see all the Wi-Fi traffic of the victim for about 30 seconds. And, but with that being said, as you all know, encryption is a standard for today's application layer. So manipulating the traffic in 30 seconds to achieve an RCE 
is not likely to succeed except in very specific situations. However, we then had a crucial insight. And I want you to remember that. The insight was that the downloads folder to which we can write any file that we want using our exploits on QuickShare for Windows is the same folder where browsers place their downloaded files. This led us to an idea. What if we could overwrite an executable that was downloaded into the downloads folder before it runs? If being a man in the middle can somehow help us know which executable files are downloaded by the browser to the downloads folder, and if we can somehow overwrite them using our abilities, then this would lead to an RCE. That is because we'll be able to replace the executable with our malicious one and then the user will run our executable. The simplest example would be a victim that downloads the VS Code installer for instance and then we overwrite it with one of our vulnerabilities right after it was downloaded and then the victim runs our executable instead of the VS Code installer. Now of course we still did not have uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, we still did not have the exact abilities we needed, but since being a man in the middle might help us anyway, we decided to start with making the Wi Fi connection last longer as it was only active for about 30 seconds. To do that, we tried to think of a way to prevent QuickShare from returning to its original Wi Fi network once a file sending session was over. Then, a very simple solution came up. Crashing QuickShare right after the Wi Fi connection to our rogue Wi Fi AP was established. The result was that if we force a Windows computer with QuickShare to connect to our Wi Fi network, to our malicious Wi Fi network, and then instantly crash the app with one of our denial of service vulnerabilities that a father found, we get a forever lasting Wi Fi connection to our Wi Fi hotspot. As regards to the crash, the fear of it preventing us from continuing to exploit the app did not exist. Why? Because when QuickShare is installed, it creates a scheduled task that runs every 15 minutes and runs QuickShare if it's not already running. So we don't really lose the ability to further exploit QuickShare. And actually, we will continue to exploit QuickShare. And this is why these two links are only the first part of our RCE attack chain. So far, we established a lasting Wi Fi connection that we expect to come in handy for identifying downloaded file. Now, let's understand the reason for why it was actually so helpful for doing that. And, the reason, and this is the reason metadata matters. Seeing this tweet by Tal Berry, which by the way had a different picture that we changed but can still be found in Tal's feed, um, we thought that it explains exactly how we leverage the Wi Fi connection. It was indeed true that files are normally downloaded over HTTPS, meaning that the traffic is encrypted. However, there were still two very important elements in the metadata of an HTTPS session. The first one is the server's domain. The encryption of HTTPS is performed using the TLS protocol, of course, and the TLS session starts with an unencrypted client hello message that is sent by the client. Normally, a server name indication extension is being added to this message, which indicates the domain of the server. That means that if you are exposed to victim's traffic, you can determine the domains that they communicate with. The second element that is present of part of the metadata of an HTTPS session is the approximate size of data that is being transferred in the session. When a file is being downloaded over HTTPS, it's normally downloaded in one TCP session. Even though encryption might add some random padding, the amount of data that is being transferred from the server to the client during a file download of the same file stays relatively the same. 
In addition, the size of an executable file is usually much bigger than the size of other pages or resources that may be transferred from a website to a client in an HTTPS session. The conclusion is that if we know the domain that the client communicated with and we know that there is a large file that is being downloaded along with its approximate size, then that means that we can also very accurately guess the name of the downloaded file. For instance, if we know that 95 megabytes were downloaded from code.visualstudio.com, then we can confidently say that the latest VS Code installer was probably downloaded. Think of the most popular installers for software that you use like VS Code for example. Entering the VS Code download page leads you to a single download button for a single VS Code version that matches your OS and is the newest one. This installer has the size of 95 megabytes which is larger than any other resource in the website. And so this really narrows down the options and makes it much easier to detect a download of the latest VS Code installer. Most websites that's of, that offer such installers have really only one relevant file. And so we framed or, and defined our new man in the middle technique more specifically. In order to be as precise as possible, we understood that we need to define what we call domain paths. A domain path is a sequence of domains to which we expect the victim to access until the download starts. Let's look at Notepad++ for example. Clicking on the download button in its website does not download the executable from the notepad++.org domain. Instead, it references github.com. Then github.com actually redirects the request to another domain and this is the final domain. It's objects.githubusercontent.com. And the file is downloaded from there. If we just look at this final domain, we won't be able to determine that the downloaded file is the installer of Notepad++. However, what we can do is to follow access to previous domains. Basically, we, what we need to do is to see that in a limited time period, Notepad++.org was accessed, followed by access to github.com and then to objects.githubusercontent.com. If that access to the final domain downloads a file with an approximate size as we expect for the installer, then we can determine that it's actually the installer. To conclude, this is how we defined the new man in the middle technique that we created. We start by creating a mapping between domain paths to executables that match these domain paths and their sizes. Then we wait until the victim hits a certain domain path in a limited time frame and we start counting the downloaded data. Finally, we check if the size of the downloaded data is equal or a bit bigger than the installer that matches this domain path. If it does, then we are safe to determine that the expected installer was indeed the one that was downloaded. And so, we chained another link to our RCE chain. Now we can also detect the name of an executable that is downloaded by a victim. That being said, for an RCE, we still need the ability to overwrite files, as we mentioned before. And we did not have it yet. But it doesn't have to be a generic ability to overwrite files using our vulnerabilities in QuickShare. It could be an ability that allows to overwrite files only in our very specific situation when files are being downloaded. So what we're trying to do is to override Google Chrome's download while it's still ongoing. So first let's understand Chrome's basic download process. When Chrome downloads a file, no matter which file it is, it starts by checking if the file name already exists. If it does, it adds a number surrounded by parentheses to the file name for the download. If it doesn't, it keeps the original name. Then it starts downloaded, downloading the file but into a temporary file with a CR download extension. 
once the download is fully complete and we got all the contents of the file, and only then Chrome renames the temporary file to the actual name of the downloaded file, and the download is, re is then really complete. But since Chrome checks whether the name already exists and decides on the final name for the downloaded file, only when it starts the download, we thought that there's good potential to create confusion if we send the file with the same name in the middle of this process. That will be after the name for the uh, final downloaded file will already be final and has been decided on. We thought it might lead Chrome to fail in renaming the downloaded file, the temporary file, to the final name for the file, leaving our file in place. But how can we know the name of the downloaded file and still send it before the download is complete? We must wait for the final TCP packet to be sent from the server in order to determine the approximate size of the file and then as a result of it determine its name. In order to prevent the download from being finished in Chrome, what we do is that we hold this last packet as the man in the middle and do not forward it to the client. So we try to send a file with the exact same name right before the download is finished hoping Chrome might be confused and will fail to rename the temporary file leaving our file as the presumably downloaded file. But unfortunately this did not work. As a result Chrome just overwrote the file that we sent finishing its download successfully deleting our malicious file. But this was not the end of it. We understood that we need to find a way to prevent Chrome from overriding our file. Then it was not long until we figured out that we maybe already have this ability. If you remember from before, one of the reproducible uh, uh, timeouts that the father found uh, was uh, a vulnerability that allowed us to bring Quickshare into a state where it continuously opens and closes any file that we want from the downloads folder of the victim. We thought that we can utilize this vulnerability just right for this case. What we hoped for is that maybe if the file is endlessly opened and closed, the file that we sent, then this will fail Chrome in overwriting it. So the result was that our hopes actually became reality and Chrome actually failed in overriding our file. It was actually the best scenario that we hoped for. Once Chrome finishes the download, the result is that it deletes the temporary CR download file, it fails to override our malicious file, in its user interface, Chrome reports that the download was finished successfully and clicking on the downloaded file in Chrome's downloads window actually runs our malicious file. Thank you. Yeah, I know, it's cool. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and so another two links were added to our RCE chain, completing it into the RCE chain attack that we were aiming for from the beginning. And Finally, we prepared a demonstration video presenting the entire Quickshell RCE attack chain for you to see it in action. So let's watch it. And before we do, I'll mention that the video starts. Um, uh, when the video starts, we'll see the attacker's computer. We'll see that that the attacker enabled a mobile hotspot on it, on um, his Windows computer, and then. We'll move, we'll move on to the victim computer where, we, where we'll see Quickshare installed. Um, and we'll start by seeing how the attacker forces the victim into to connecting to the Wi Fi hotspot that the attacker created. Okay, so let's begin. So we can see that the hotspot is enabled, and we'll see just the IP address on that hotspot. Now we run our tool and we find nearby victims. One of them is called test machine. We choose test machine. This is test machine. And now it's connected to safe bridge, but we force it into connecting to our test AP and crash quicker to make it 
um, to make the Wi-Fi connection last, and now we see all the domains that the victim accesses. Now the victim, the victim goes into the Spotify website to download the uh, Spotify for Windows installer. We can see that the download folder is just empty, there's nothing inside. Now the victim downloads the file. Let's see what happens uh, with the download. It's now complete. We click it and our malware runs instead. Now, thank you. Now let's do the same with Notepad++. We go into its website, download the newest version of Notepad++ for Windows. The victim downloads the file. The download starts. You can see that we can do that for many installers. So the download is now finished and the victim runs it and it's again our malicious executable. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So I know it might seem like we found the, exactly the vulnerabilities that we needed to build this LC, LC chain, but in reality, it was a bit different. In fact, we discovered two additional vulnerabilities. One allowed us to send file to the parent folder of downloads folder, and other let us crash quick share by leveraging some of the findings from all magic dot research that he presented last April. However, these vulnerability weren't you, uh, were not used um, in the RCE chain and could not be exploited for uh, remote code execution. We'll share more details about them in our upcoming blog post that will be published after this talk. Overall, we identified 10 distinct vulnerabilities along with additional bug in Chrome. We reported all of these vulnerabilities to Google at the end of January this year. They've, confi they've confirmed they fixed every one of them, every one of them. Google decided to issue two CVEs for these 10 vulnerabilities. The first CVE addresses how uh, two of the vulnerabilities can uh, combine, can force a persistent Wi-Fi connection. The second CVE deals with bypassing the file approval dialog in Windows. Google was very responsive throughout the process, confirming and reproducing each of the vulnerability we reported. We wanted to thank them for their collaboration and for addressing these issues. Here's their official response. You can take a moment to read it now, but of course it will, all, uh, it will be included in the published presentation. Give you a few seconds. So we've covered pretty much everything about the technical flow, and now it's time to talk about the takeaways, which, which are just as important. Our first and most significant takeaway is that standard stones may sometimes be forged into the lead ROMs. What we mean by that is that as a hacker, you often have limited tools at your disposal. You might achieve something, but it's not exactly what you are aiming for. Reflecting on our research, we believe that even seamlessly basic or unimpressive abilities can sometimes be transformed into much, much greater, uh, much more powerful uh, capabilities. We're all familiar with uh, the typical chains of vulnerabilities that addresses known issue like bypassing stack cookies or other memory corruption mitigations. But it's not always so straightforward. Sometimes you might have unconventional abilities like forcing an endless loop that repeatedly opens a file. For real, who thought this ability might be helpful? So this can use to create a very unconventional flows that still allow you to achieve your ultimate goal. The next takeaway shifts to the defensive side. Many products leave known issue and bugs unfixed due to prioritization. Often this issue seems to pose no security risk or only minor ones that doesn't require immediate attention. However, addressing these known issue bugs or minor security risks can sometimes be crucial for mitigating much greater risk that you might not be aware of. For example, if we didn't have the DOS vulnerability that allows QuickShare to crash, we wouldn't be able to have a, a, establish a stable Wi-Fi connection, and this would have completely disabled our RC chain. Lastly, it's crucial for organizations to develop software and that develop software to focus not only on specific programming mistakes like memory corruption bugs. When evaluating a program security, it's important to take a broader perspective and consider whether a simple logic or intended behavior might also introduce security risk. 
That's pretty much it. Here's the QR code for our repository. Feel free to take picture. It has a lot of tools uh, to play with QuickShare. You can also find the contact details for all and myself. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining to our session. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was really fun.